May 19, 1983, an extremely calm woman arrives at the McKenzie Williamette Medical Center in Springfield, Oregon. In her car are her three children, ages eight, seven, and three. They've all been shot by what she described as a bushy-haired man. What transpired on this night is still a mystery to some, but to others, it's a straightforward homicide. This is the story of Diane Downs, mother or murderer. Hey y'all, I'm Chris Calvert. And I'm her husband, Rob Potter. Welcome to Hitch to Homicide. For better or worse. Till death do us part. Welcome back, everybody. Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. And for everyone that we like and love, <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Just couldn't do it today. Huh? No, and, and there's a reason, and it's because we're going to make a little announcement here. We are making an announcement. Yeah. I'm going to do it right now. So yeah. I'm going to start off with wherever you're listening, be sure to like, rate, and review. And if you're watching on our new YouTube channel, there you go. Yay! <laughs> be sure to subscribe. Yep. That's all you got to do is click that little button down there. Join our closed Facebook group, The In-Laws and Outlaws. It's a place where we post lots of extra information. So come on over and join the family. This is a case that was suggested by one of our In-Laws and Outlaws. Yeah. Well, and let me let me interrupt just for a second. The, the reason I didn't have a, a welcome, welcome, welcome is because I was busy setting up things for our inaugural YouTube I know video. we've got like the so. whole RP Music Studios, H2H Studios going. It's crazy. It's very <laughs> exciting. I haven't, I've never been this well lit in my life. <laughs> I promise I'll have a, a welcome, welcome, welcome next okay. week. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll do it. <laughs> All right. We'll do it. This week's case is really interesting. It's got a little bit of a twist at the end, so don't wait. I mean, don't stop listening. Go all the way to the end. <laughs> don't wait. Don't, don't stop. Don't wait. Don't stop. <laughs> no, listen until the end because there's some interesting information there, and I've got tons of links for this uh, case, so you can really go down a huge rabbit hole. Nice. And I'm going to thank some sources. And while I do, you're going to see why there's a rabbit hole. Uh -oh. So here they are. Inside Edition, Diane Downs TV. Wow. Yes, there's a YouTube channel just for this woman oh and the God. evidence that was gathered against her. Real Crime, World's Most Evil Killers, Wikipedia, All That's Interesting, The Corvallis Gazette Times, The Oregonian, The World Newspaper in Coos Bay, Oregon, and DianeDowns.com. <laughs> There's a whole website. And there is a book all about this case entitled Small Sacrifices by Anne Rule. It's a very deep dive. If you're interested, I will have a link to the book and all those sources in the show notes. Good. Are you ready to do this? Let's do it. Elizabeth Diane Fredrickson is born on August 7th, 1955 in Phoenix, Arizona. She's the oldest of four children. Her father, Wesley, was the postmaster. Oh. And her mother, Willa Dean, great name, Willa Dean, is a stay-at-home mother. Now, Diane's going to say that her father sexually abused oh. her at the age of 12 and that she tried to commit suicide by cutting her wrist when she was just 13. That's too bad. Now, this is Diane's account. Okay. By all other accounts, her upbringing was, was pretty normal. Her father was very strict. The family was conservative and religious. She had lots of rules growing up. Hmm. But pretty much it's the all-American family. Okay. But she's eventually going to rebel. She drops the Elizabeth from her name. And just goes by Diane. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. This happens when she's 15 years old. Okay. She attends Moon Valley High School in Phoenix, Arizona. And this is where she meets and falls in love with Steve 
Downs. Okay. Now, Diane was a straight A student, and her parents aren't a fan of the relationship that she has with Steve. Why not? I never really saw any reason why, but maybe it was just because they didn't think Steve was the right guy for her. Maybe he wasn't conservative <laughs> enough. Like like every parent. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe he just wasn't conservative. I right. don't I don't know. Right. Because this family is is very conservative. But Steve joins the Navy. And after graduation in the spring of 1973, Diane enrolls in the Pacific Coast Bible College in Orange, California. Okay. So conservative. Sure. But not long after she arrives, she's expelled for promiscuous behavior. <laughs> Nothing worse going on than promiscuous behavior at the Bible at college. The Bible college. Mm-hmm. Oops. Yeah. So their code of conduct was no smoking, no alcohol, no porn, no sex outside of marriage or other sexual perversions, hmm. which is sexual communication, be that verbal, written, electronic, no profanity, no stealing, no gambling, and no witchcraft. They were still allowed to breathe, right? Which includes a <laughs> Astrology. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, by the way, I'm a Capricorn. If you can't tell, we're very bossy, <laughs> always in charge. That's me. But also no gambling, no witchcraft, no astrology and and no fun. Yeah. No fun for Diane. That's yeah. what she thinks. Yeah. So she's kicked out of Bible college and she moves back home with her parents in Phoenix, but not for long. Because Diane runs away from home at the tender age of 18, and she will marry Steve Downs. She gets back with him. Yeah, she marries Steve on November 13th, 1973. Okay. Now, I don't think the marriage between Steve and Diane was ever a match made in heaven. But in October of 1974, Christy Ann Downs is born. And she's going to get a sister, Cheryl Lynn, in 1976. That's my sister's name. It is. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Now, after the girls are born, Steve gets a vasectomy. But according to Diane, he never went back to be tested after the procedure. Okay. And Diane gets pregnant again. Hmm. And when this happens, Steve is saying to her, who, who the hell is the father of this child? Yeah, that was my first thought. <laughs> yeah, and Diane tells him that the baby is his. Now, I actually know somebody that this happened to, got a vasectomy, got his wife pregnant, and she was like, it's yours. And he's like, who the hell is the father of this child? So I guess if you, and I don't guess, I know, if you get a vasectomy, you have to go yeah. back and have that yeah. checked. It's not a, a 100% it's no, yeah, yeah, you always have to make sure that there are yeah. no more swimmers. Yeah. But I don't really know if this baby was his or not. But according to Diane, Steve forced her to have an abortion at six weeks. Hmm. And also, according to Diane, in order to replace that baby, she goes out and seduces a co-worker that she has handpicked based on his traits that he's smart, he's handsome, he's physically able, and she gets pregnant. Wow. And her husband, Steve, now knows that this baby is not his. Right. Fool fool me once, shame on you. Yeah, fool me (laughs) twice, shame on me. But somehow he's still sticking around. Hmm. And she gives birth to little Daniel, 1979. Now, there are loads of reports that when the kids are little, that she leaves them alone to fend for themselves, basically. These are tiny little human beings. She also dumps them off at her parents' house a lot. Her husband, Steve, has been quoted as saying, Diane really got around. (laughs) That's her husband. That's her husband. Uh, So he basically says his wife is, is cheating. Yeah. Hi, I'm married to a floozy, but I love her. Yeah, his wife is sleeping around a lot. And he also says that Diane was never good to the children. Like, ever. Wow. I've also read that he was also a player. And again, I said from the beginning, this wasn't a match made in heaven. Yeah, it kind of sounds like it. Steve and Diane fight a lot. As you might imagine, if you know your wife is sleeping with other men and getting pregnant on purpose. (laughs) In an interview, Diane talked about how she contemplated suicide at the time or 
instead of killing herself, killing Steve. Oh, wow. Now, there's actually one altercation where Diane pulls a Ruger 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol out and shoots, according to her, not at Steve, but past him. Wow. Like it's a warning shot. That's called foreshadowing. <laughs> Here we go. But after eight years of marriage in 1980, Steve and Diane get a divorce. Steve is free and clear of Diane. <laughs> but as the children get older, she really begins to neglect them even more. Like neighbors would say that the kids would get home from school and then wait for hours outside for their mother to come home. Like really? just sitting on the porch. So they were locked out and they couldn't get in. So they just had to wait. Yeah. Wow. I mean, there were lots of latchkey kids back then. So, you know, give them a key, let them in, let them fix themselves something to eat. But apparently they were just sitting out on the porch. Yeah. Then Diane becomes a surrogate. She's not mother of the year by any stretch of the imagination. And she's a surrogate. Wow. And I read where at the time in the early 80s, there were only about 100 women in the entire United States who were surrogates. Wow. And Diane is one of them, the woman who leaves her kids out on the front porch. Wow. She is even interviewed by national news about being a surrogate. And she liked that. Really? A lot. Wow. She loved that limelight that it gave her. She loved being interviewed. It was all about Diane. So she was basically an attention seeker. She's a narcissist yeah. is what she is. Yeah. Now, she's paid $10,000 in 1981 by a couple to have their child, which today would be about $33,000. Okay. And Diane has a baby girl on May 8th, 1982. She names this little girl Jennifer. But it seemed odd to me because when you're acting as a surrogate, you're just the vessel. Yeah. So the naming of the baby isn't for you to give. Right. So I don't know if this is something she just did on her own, in her own head or mm -hmm. what. Yeah. But let's talk about all these pregnancies, okay? Because Diane seemed to like being pregnant. I, on the other hand, did, did not like <laughs> being pregnant. I was a very bad pregnant person. I was so sick the entire time. Both of my children were grounded by the time they were born. I was just like, done. <laughs> get out. Yeah, get but out. She, get out. But she didn't seem to really, she loved being pregnant. Right. She really didn't seem to like the babies after mm. they were born. She liked the process. Yeah, she liked being pregnant. She didn't like the babies. Gotcha. And then there are those mental health professionals who've said that in Diane's head, she was creating relationships by having these children. Hmm. And if you listen to one of her first interviews, this really seems to be true. So after she gives birth to the baby girl for the couple, she gets a job at the U.S. Post Office. Okay. I can only think that her dad maybe helped her with this. You know, perhaps he helped her with this since he's a postmaster. Okay, yeah, okay. Now, it's while she's living in and working at this post office in Phoenix, she starts sleeping around with many of the guys who worked there. And I'm not so sure that Diane wasn't a sex addict. Yeah. Or perhaps she used sex as a weapon to get what she wanted. Right. But eventually, as she's going out with these guys at the post office, she meets Robert Knickerbocker who is also known as Nick. Okay. Now, I'm just going to tell you, there are lots of great names <laughs> in this in this story. Yeah, Knickerbocker. Knickerbocker, he goes by Nick. Diane falls head over heels for Nick. But there's a problem. And the problem is, Nick is a married man. That usually kind of messes up any kind of new relationship. Well, maybe not, not for Diane. That's <laughs> true. He's had a wife for 10 years but these two start a torrid affair. And I think Nick was okay with having this extramarital affair. Maybe the sex was that good. Who knows? But Nick wasn't interested in leaving his wife. Right. And it's important to note, Robert Knickerbocker and his wife did not have children. Mm. He did not want kids. Gotcha. That's also called foreshadowing. <laughs> There's lots of foreshadowing. Lots of foreshadowing. <laughs> So Nick doesn't mind knocking himself off a piece on occasion. That's what I wrote in my notes. <laughs> but he is not interested in getting divorced or getting married to Diane. Okay. So when she starts telling him this is what she wants, Nick backs way off. Yeah, you think? Yeah. 
He kind of got into the relationship in the first place because he thought it would be like a few rolls in the hay and yeah. then she'd be done with him and would be off to the next guy. Instead, he's got fatal attraction. Yeah. I mean, I've seen an interview with her where she says that she had 10 lovers in two years. Wow. So that's a new guy about every two and a half months. And this is what Nick is thinking. She'll be done with me in eight to 10 weeks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll run its course and yeah, we'll move on. But guess what, Robert Knickerbocker? You're the one she wants. Wow. And she becomes obsessed with him. She's really fixated on Nick. She wants to be his wife. Dan, you will not ignore me. Oh, I'm getting to that. I can't believe you're saying that. Just wait a second. I have a whole section written in my notes about this. I can't believe you did that. You're stealing my thunder. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let me, let me back that up. <laughs> this is, we share a brain. Oh my gosh. Anyway, Nick says, no, thank you. I don't want to be your husband. Right. Nick tells her on no uncertain terms that he didn't want to become the father to her children and he didn't want to have any children with her. I mean, this is a woman who's even been a surrogate. She loves being pregnant. Right. She wants to have a baby with this man. But Nick has said, no way. And it's now the end of 1981, and Diane and her three children move north to Springfield, Oregon, which is just outside of Eugene, Oregon, which is home to the University of Oregon. Okay. Her mail route is the city of Cottage Grove. And it's in Diane's head. She's thinking, all I have to do is get Nick out of Phoenix, and he'll leave his wife, and we can play happy family. There you go. So she thinks Nick is going to eventually join her in Oregon. So for two whole years, Diane writes every day to Nick. Every day. Wow. She goes back to Phoenix to see him. She begs him to be with her. She's doing everything her extremely obsessed self can think of to win the affections of Nick. Quote, my dearest Nick, I miss you so much. I know I'll spend several wonderful hours with you tomorrow, but that seems like 100 years from now as I sit alone. I want so badly to wrap myself around you and hold you so close and tight that you'll never go away again, end quote. <laughs> and Nick's, Nick the whole time is going, oh my God, what have I done? Well, Nick, who's also a, a postman, Nick is now sending these letters back. <laughs> He's sending them sender. back unopened <laughs> to her. Wow. He doesn't want to see her. He doesn't want to be with her. And as I was researching this, I was thinking the only thing missing was for Diane to cook Nick's pet rabbit, right? <laughs> it's exactly what you were saying. Yeah. She's Glenn Close in Fatal Attraction. Scotty just raised his head when you said boil the rabbit. <laughs> rabbit, your rabbit. Yeah, yeah. She's Alex Forrester sitting in the dark, yeah. listening to Madam Butterfly while turning the lamp on oh, and off. Yeah. She's batshit crazy. Wow. I'm not going to be ignored, Dan. <laughs> I actually wrote that. I'm not going to be ignored, Dan. There's so many good lines from that movie. Oh, yeah. But I think my favorite is Tom Hanks in Sleepless in Seattle when he asks his son Jonah if he'd seen Fatal Attraction and the little <laughs> Jonah says, you wouldn't let me. And Tom Hanks says, well, I saw it and it scared the shit out of me. It scared the shit out of every man in America. <laughs> it did. <laughs> <laughs> and every man listening to this podcast is nodding right now. Yep, absolutely. But it, it increased fidelity for a long time yeah, after that movie was I out. I won't be ignored, Dan. <laughs> oh, my God. But that is who Diane is. I can't frame her any better than that. Wow. It's been two years, and now in her head, she's got to get rid of her children wow. if she's going to have a chance with this man that she loves. Unbelievable. And from everything I've read and researched, she never had a chance with the man she's in love with or obsessed well, with. Yeah, of course. Jeez. She's ignoring and neglecting her children, this according to others, not Diane. And there is one report of a neighbor of Diane's parents saying that while the children were visiting, the middle child, Cheryl, said that she was afraid of her mother. Oh, wow. So here we go. Uh oh. May 19th, 1983. According to Diane, she loads up the kids in the car. She goes to a friend's house, a co-worker in Marcola, Oregon, which is just north of Springfield. But on this night, May 19th, her co-worker had 
no idea that Diane was coming with her children to her home. So it was just out of the blue. Yeah. And Uh, this woman, her name is Heather. She thinks it's weird that Diane and the kids have shown up there. Yeah. She shows up out of the blue and Diane had never visited Heather at home before like this. But here's the thing. Heather lives in the middle of nowhere in Oregon and she has some horses and the kids get to see them and pet them. At least they get to do that. Yeah. And then at around 9.45 p.m. with eight-year-old Christy, seven-year-old Cheryl and three-year-old Danny in the car, she drives and decides to take the scenic route. Why did she do that? Well, you're about to find out. Okay. Now, on her scenic route, which is on the opposite side of town from where she actually lives, she drives to a rural area on Old Mohawk Road. Now, according to Diane, as she's driving, she sees a strange man standing in the road and he's flagging her down. Just so happens to be in the middle of the road. Yeah. So at night... In the dark, in rural Oregon, where I always think that Bigfoot is about two (laughs) steps behind me, Diane has her three children in tow in a state that had about 28 or 29 serial killers in the 1980s. I did go and count that because I wanted to know. Right. So what does she do? She pulls the car over to stop and talk to this man. Like any normal person would do. Yeah, I guess. No. (laughs) No. Diane described him as a bushy-haired stranger, not the kind of guy you'd probably stop in the dark for. When you got three kids in the car. Yeah, but Diane says that she got out of the car to talk to him. Which nobody would do. No. Yeah. And this is when he demands that she give him her car keys. She refused, and these two get into a scuffle that results in him shooting her In the left arm, in the left forearm, he then opened the driver's side door and shot all three of her children. Eight-year-old Christy is shot in the chest twice. She raises her hand in defense and a bullet goes through her hand and into her heart. She's sitting in the back seat of the passenger side. Three-year-old Danny is in the driver's back seat and he is shot in the back. Mm. He has a single gunshot wound to the spine. Seven-year-old Cheryl was shot in the back from about six inches away from her body, and the bullet will exit through her sternum and will be recovered in the front seat of the passenger side of the car. So let me guess, Diane was probably right-handed, wasn't she? Diane was (laughs) right-handed. Cheryl is actually shot a second time in the lower torso closer to her hip, and that bullet actually lodges into her body. Now, Diane says she then pretended to toss her keys into the bush. Like, there, I'm throwing my keys. While the bushy-haired man went to look for them, she jumped back into the car and she sped away, going straight to the nearest hospital with her three wounded children. Yeah, okay, whatever. Now, at some point, while Diane is trying to get away from the bushy-haired man, she manages to get a piece of fabric from the trunk of her car to wrap up her own arm. But she doesn't perform any life-saving measures on her own children, other than to drive them to the hospital. Right. Diane drives to the McKenzie Williamette Medical Center just six miles away from where the shooting happened. If she drove at top speed, as one might if their children have just been shot, you could probably make it there in less than 10 minutes. It is a windy road. But Diane drove very slowly to the hospital. She was driving so slow that she's holding up traffic going 10 miles an hour or less. (laughs) It's a windy road, just like I said, and the folks behind her had to go slow, too. But when she finally arrives at the hospital, it's close to 1030. Wow. These kids, at least a half hour, they've been shot. At least a half hour later, they're showing up at the hospital. Cheryl is on the floor of the front side of the passenger seat. She's dead. She's choked on her own blood while her mother drives 10 miles an hour. Diane falls out of her red Nissan with these Arizona plates in the drive of the emergency room. Very dramatic. And she yells at the staff, please save my children. (laughs) But Cheryl is dead and Christy and Danny are on the brink of death. 
Chrissy wasn't even able to speak to the nurses and doctors at the hospital because she's had a stroke from all of the blood loss. Oh, wow. Danny, because he's shot in the spine, is now paralyzed. paralyzed. Only one person is bandaged up, and that's Diane. So she tells police about the man flagging her down, how the bushy-haired man and the carjacker shot her and her three children, and how she tricked him by pretending to throw the keys away, and then, according to her, drove like a bat out of hell to get her dying children to the hospital. At 10 miles an hour. But the police think this isn't adding up. This is hinky. Yeah. Everybody's baffled. Why would she stop for a man she didn't know? And more than that, she was acting odd. Diane was very calm. She was also giggling. She was laughing. Really? She wasn't acting like a woman who just brought her three children into the hospital after being shot. Wow. And then finding out that one of them is actually dead. When she gets to the hospital, she calls Robert Nick Knickerbocker. I'm sure he's ready to get a call from her. Who's still married, <laughs> still in Phoenix, still thinks Diane has lost her damn mind, wow. even before this so-called carjacking and shooting. So when the doctors start telling Diane about the state of her children, they tell her that Danny, the three-year-old who'd been hit in the spine, was paralyzed. Right. To which Diane says, quote, you mean it didn't hit him in the heart, end quote. Wow. When they tell her about Christy's injuries and that she's had a stroke due to the blood loss, Diane tells the doctors, quote, that if Christy is going to have any kind of brain damage to let her die, end quote. Jeez. Are you serious? Yes. So they're telling her about all the things that are going on with her children. One is dead. One's paralyzed. The other's just had a stroke and is unable to speak. And Diane is incredibly indifferent. She shows no emotion. There's no crying. Nothing. There's no heart. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Now, I realize that people react differently to horrific situations. You can be in shock or disbelief when something horrible happens. Yeah. But that is really a thing. If you're a mother and your children, yeah, come on. But Diane is pretty much blank. I mean, unless she's laughing or giggling. So this is unusual for sure. But when Diane goes into the triage room where Christy is, she leans over and she's whispering to her oldest daughter, I love you. And the nurses notice that Christy has this terrified look on her face. Of course, her mom just shot her. And her heart rate goes through the roof. Her daughter is afraid of her mother. Yeah. She's deathly afraid. And the hospital notices this. And one of the first people at the hospital and on the scene is Lane County Detective Doug Welsh. And he thinks Diane is suspect Number one. Oh, yeah. And along with him is Detective Richard Tracy. <laughs> That's right. No, Dick Tracy. There's on a the- Dick Tracy <laughs> on the case. <laughs> I knew uh, you'd get a kick out of that. I love that. Dick Tracy's on the case. You know she's going to get nailed now. Yeah. Well, the children are put into foster care and kept away from their mother. And it's almost like she's okay with that. Wow. She does try to get custody. She does try to get rights to see them. They're kind of keeping her away from them. But the police start collecting evidence. And a man named Jim Pex, who is a forensic guy and a state trooper, goes through Diane's car. And here's what he finds. Inside the passenger side door and underneath the car, he finds bloodstains in the door jam. And the direction of the blood spatter is wrong. It's very wrong compared to what Diane has told the police, how the whole thing played out. Sure. That the bushy haired man was standing outside the car on the driver's side. But that's not what the blood spatter is showing. Gotcha. The passenger side of the door was open, not closed when the blood spatter was created. And that's inconsistent with Diane's version of what happened. Yeah. Yeah. So forensics are showing that Cheryl, who was in the front seat, was shot at least once when she was outside the car and face down. Like she was shot once, opened her door to try to get away, Uh, and was shot again at close range. 
Also, there's blood under the car, too. There are small blood stains, like someone was coughing blood Mm -hmm. or was shot at close range, just like Cheryl. Right. So how does the bushy-haired man do that from the passenger side? He can't. He's a magician. And there are no blood spatters on the driver's side door. There are none. So she's not telling the truth. The forensics aren't lining up with her story. Yeah, she didn't think this through. (laughs) Yeah. Jim Pex knows that whoever shot Cheryl wasn't on the driver's side. And they know that the gunshot is at close range. And as far as Christy and Danny are concerned, the gunpowder burns on their bodies showed that they'd both been shot by someone who was inside the car And also at very close range, not standing outside the car like Diane has said over and over again that the bushy haired man was. So the physical evidence is showing that she's lying and she's probably the killer. But she starts talking to the press. Mm. She's upset that the police are even looking at her. A mother. Mm. And, And she's the killer of her children and the person who would paralyze her son and shot her other daughter. So police just... Sit back and they let Diane go. (laughs) Let her go. Let her go (laughs) because Diane loves to talk. She loves the limelight. So they're thinking if we give her enough rope, she's going to hang herself, so to speak. (laughs) Yeah, she's making her own noose. Yeah. Yeah. She was mad because they weren't looking for the bushy haired stranger. (laughs) And they weren't. No. They were only looking at her. And there are their police composites of the bushy haired stranger. I will post them in the in-laws and outlaws. I mean, it's it's something else. It was on the front page of the newspaper and everybody was, you know, they were looking for this guy. Right. They were looking for this guy. Right. But one reason that they're looking at her was that the gun used to murder Cheryl, maim Danny and Christy, was a Ruger 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Huh. This- Imagine that. Yeah, the same type of gun that Cheryl owned and had used before when threatening Steve back before they were divorced. And I'm assuming that uh, Ruger is not just a, an everyday common gun. I mean, it, a, a semi-automatic pistol is not an everyday, I don't yeah. think, is an everyday kind of gun. Right. But, you know, if you're a gun owner, you might be like, that's nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's, that's true. absolutely nothing. So I think that's all subjective as to whether or not. But, right, right. yeah. So on June 20th, a month after the shooting, the state of Oregon issues a search warrant for Diane Downs' home in Mm. Springfield, Oregon. She lives in a duplex, and the police think that it's odd when they walk in that her house isn't filled with photos of her children. Her children. It is full of photos of (laughs) Diane. It's filled with pictures of her. Oh, wow. And they also find this statue of a unicorn. And it's it's all engraved. And on the bottom, it has the date May 13th, 1983, just six days before May 19th when the children are shot. And on the bottom, it says, Mommy loves you. It has all the kids' names. It's like she's memorialized the kids before she shoots them. You know, she's got the whole thing planned out. She she knows what she wants to do, and she knows what she wants the end result to be. She does. Yeah. But then, as they're searching the house, they find Diane's diary. Uh-oh. And in the diary, she talks all about Nick. And they realize that Diane has possibly tried to kill all of her children. So Nick will leave his wife and come to Oregon to be with her. Well, that would make any man want to leave their wife. I mean, you (laughs) killed your children for me. We're going to hear from him just a little bit. Hang on. All right. They also find a rifle, a twenty-two caliber, and they're like, "Hmm, isn't the murder weapon a twenty-two?" So they did ballistics testing on the rifle, which was also a Ruger. It wasn't a match, but they have the same extractor marks as the casings. From the car. Okay. So the extraction marks, if you load the bullets and then you take them back out again, they leave extractor marks. And so the extractor marks that are on the 22 rifle in the home are the same as the extractor marks that are on the casings 
in the car. Yeah, and that's pretty much like a fingerprint. Yeah. N- no two guns are exactly alike. Well, that's ballistics. This is a little bit different, but yes, oh, okay. it is. Because right. these these bullets haven't been fired that they find, ah, but the okay. extraction marks match the ones on the bullets that had been fired. Okay, all right. And it's the same run of bullets. So they check the sales records and find that, in fact, Diane did own a Ruger twenty two semi-automatic pistol, and that was the gun that was used in the shooting. But the gun is not found at the scene. Okay. The gun is not found for a long time. Well, we're going to talk about that. All right. Now, while all of this is happening, Nick Knickerbocker is still talking on the phone to Diane. Yeah. But he is recording ah, the phone calls. Gotcha. There's a whole YouTube devoted to it. Okay. And I'll put a link in the show notes. All right. All right. But he says to her, quote, I know there's no way you're stopping for some in the middle of the road late at night, (laughs) end quote. Wow. He tells her that her story, quote, don't sound good, not a lick, end (laughs) quote. And when he starts to push her on whether she shot her children because he didn't want kids and she thought he was coming to Oregon to be her man, she gets angry. She gets really angry with him and she says, quote, you ain't worth murder, end quote. Wow. But these markings on these spent shells and the gun in her home are enough for them to arrest Diane. February 28th, 1984, nine months after the shooting, Diane Downs is finally arrested. Bad boys, bad boys, (laughs) what you gonna do? Here's what they think happened. She wanted out of her responsibilities as a mom so she could convince Robert Nick Knickerbocker to be with her. In her twisted mind, that was the only thing standing between the two of them. Right. Her children and him not wanting kids. But of course, there was more to it than that. Robert had been returning her mail forever. So she plans this whole thing. She goes to her co-worker's home unannounced. She waits until it's late and it's dark. She drives along this rural road that is not on her way home. Then she shoots all three of her children, hoping to fatally wound them. Then she shoots herself in the arm to make it look like she was a victim, too. Yeah. Then she takes a bandage from her trunk and tends to her own wound while the children are dying and bleeding out. And instead of driving the six miles quickly, she barely goes 10 miles an hour to the hospital, hoping they will die. Yeah, exactly. And when she arrives, she feigns the victim and gives the story of the bushy haired man. Now, how do they know that she drove so slowly? Well, the one person behind her recognized that it was a red Nissan with a red Arizona license plate. Ah. So something that you don't see all the time in Oregon. And it was actually, I think, her son, the lady who's behind the wheel. It was her son who said, do all red cars in Arizona have red license plates? And that's why she made the connection and remembered it. Wow. And what's ironic about that, it's a child that noticed it. It was a child who noticed it. I mean, that's kind of something that a kid would notice. You know, that's interesting. It's a red car. It's a red license plate. Yeah. So back to Diane, lies, lies, lies. She's arrested. And when she's arraigned at the Lane County Courthouse, after they read the charges, all the legal speak is over. Diane's attorney stands up and drops a bomb. What do you think it is? I have no idea. Diane is pregnant. Oh, God. And it would be bad for her baby, Uh, for her to be in custody while she's awaiting trial. Wow. Now, the town is all a titter. The (laughs) rumor was that the father of the baby was a local reporter. Remember, she's been given all these interviews. She loved the limelight. This is like the musical Chicago. (laughs) A little bit. I mean, you know. Jeez. He had sex with her and she got preggers, but she loved all of this attention. She was always smiling and giggling and acting like everything was just fine. And in fact, on the day she buried her daughter while her two children were in the hospital fighting for their lives, she gave a video statement to the police officers. I've seen it. And in this video statement, she's smiling. 
She's smiling. She's explaining how she was in the car, how the bushy haired man came up to the car. She accidentally bumps her arm because she has a steel plate in her arm now. She talks about this. I can't tie my shoes. Oh, woe is me. All the things that are wrong with me. My arm hurts. Mm. Yeah. While her children are fighting for their lives. Yeah. But she uh, hits her arm and she's like, oh, my gosh. And then she laughs after it. It's just disgusting. Wow. It's disgusting. Yeah. By the time the trial rolls around May 8th, 1984, Diane is eight months pregnant. Wow. She loves the attention she's getting. Every time she comes into the courtroom, she's wearing these maternity dresses. And she's hoping that it's going to give her some sympathy yeah. from the jury. Sure. But they're not really buying it because there's all this forensic evidence. And then her daughter, Christy, who had been finally recovering, will take the stand as the prosecution's star witness. Oh, 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 wow. She didn't count on that. I guess she didn't think her kids were going to survive. Yeah. Now, on top of all of this, it's important to know that the district attorney, the guy, the lead prosecutor, his name is Fred Hughey and his wife, Joanne, they have adopted both Christine and Danny. Really? So now he's basically prosecuting the birth mother and playing father at home at the same time. Wow. Christine takes the stand and they ask her. Who shot you, your sister, and your brother? And Christine says, my mom did it. She goes on to tell the court how her mom pulled over, got out of the car, went to the trunk to get something. We all know later that the something she got was the gun. Yeah. She first shot Cheryl. Then she shot Danny in the back. Then she shot her twice in the chest. And then her mother shot herself in the arm. This is a tiny little girl doing this, giving this testimony. But her testimony is the final nail in the coffin. Yeah. Diane Downs maintained her innocence and said that they coached her daughter. They coached Christine to say these things, that they turned her children against her. But there are other problems with her story. She later told the police that there wasn't just one bushy haired man. There were two men and that they called her by her name. And this is completely different from the lone bushy haired man thing, right? Yeah. On June 17th, 1984, the jury found Diane Downs guilty of the murder of her daughter, Cheryl, and the attempted murder of her son, Danny, and daughter, Christine. Good. Ten days after her guilty verdict and before her sentencing, Diane gives birth to a little girl. She named her Amy Elizabeth. Okay. The baby was seized by the state of Oregon and adopted by Chris and Jackie Babcock, who renamed her Rebecca. Nice. When she recovers from the birth, Diane is sentenced to life plus 50 years. Good. She was sent to the Oregon Women's Correctional Center in Salem, Oregon. But on July 11th, 1987, just three years after she's incarcerated, Diane escapes from her cell and the prison by scaling an 18-foot razor wire fence. Oh, jeez. For 10 days, Diane eludes law enforcement. There was a 14-state manhunt for her. (laughs) They eventually tracked her down, like, just miles away from the prison at the home of one of her former cellmate's husband. And he was apparently living with other men. After she's captured, one of the guys in the house said that he thought Diane was trying to get pregnant. What? Yes. (laughs) She's mental. Yeah. Diane is transferred to the New Jersey Department of Corrections Clinton Correction Facility for Women. This because the now parents of Christy and Danny, Fred Hughley, the DA, he really pushed for this. And part of that reason was that the Salem prison where she escaped was just 66 miles from the house where her biological children were living. Yeah, I'd want to put her away as far away as possible. She tried to escape in New Jersey in 1989 and again in 1991. Then in 1994, Diane is moved again 
this time to California and the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Yeah. And while she's there, she gets her associate degree in general studies and she also tries to escape. <laughs> well, you got to give her credit. She's, she just keeps trying. Yeah, exactly. If at first you don't succeed. Try, try again. Yeah. And that's what she's doing. Yeah. Diane's moved again in 2010 to Valley State Prison for Women in Chowchilla. Diane wasn't considered for parole until 2009, and her first parole hearing was December 9th, 2008, where she stated she was rehabilitated. Innocent. Oh, damn, she, she never did it. I'm innocent. This this didn't happen. Oh uh, she wrote a 12-page letter to the parole board. Three hours of interviews were conducted and 30 minutes of deliberation, and she was denied denied parole. Yeah. Then she came up again for parole in December of 2010, and again, she was denied. denied. Then she came up for parole again in 2020, and again, denied. denied. Yeah. She will be eligible once more for parole in 2025, so in two years. How old will she be then? Well, right now, Diane is 67. Okay. As for her children, Christine went on to attend the University of Oregon in Eugene. She got married. She had kids. She even had a daughter who she named Cheryl after her sister. Mm. Christine and her biological mother have not had any form of communication. Well, that's a surprise. Not. Yeah. Yeah. Danny, who is paralyzed from the waist down, works on computers, yeah. and he has maintained a very low profile. Yeah. As for Becky Babcock, the daughter who was born right after Diane's conviction, right. she's been really open and vocal about her biological mother and even went on the Oprah Winfrey show back in the day. How does she feel about her? She does not like her. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, what's what she's saying? No, just that, that her mother is a monster, yeah. that her biological mom is a monster. Yeah. Becky is actually a behavioral health coordinator oh, in wow. Oregon. Wow. Yeah. And let's talk about Diane's ex-husband. Well, during the whole kerfuffle of the arrest and the murder and the trial of his ex-wife, it's determined that perhaps he's not the best father for the children. Yeah. Because they're going to need all this extra care. This is a child who's paralyzed and another daughter who's had a stroke. Sure. and. They all needed, you know, physical therapy and rehabilitation. And this is why they're adopted by the prosecuting attorney and his wife. Gotcha. And these two became really attached to the children while they were recovering in the hospital. That's how that all began. Gotcha. Now, there is a website, dianedowns.com, where they dispute everything <laughs> about this case. And I mean everything. That there was DNA evidence that the court denied processing that would have exonerated Diane. That there were 383 leads that might have proved her innocence. They were all withheld by the prosecution. The most interesting one for me is that the shooter would have been covered in gunpowder residue. Mm -hmm. This is very true. And that night at the hospital, Diane tested negative hmm. for gunpowder. Okay. She changed her clothes? Don't know. Yeah. Also, that the shooter would have blood spatter on their person. Diane did not. Did she change her clothes? I don't know. <laughs> the website says that the 22 caliber Ruger that was Diane's was actually recovered in a drug raid in California. And the ballistics from that gun did not match the casings from the shooting that night. Hmm. Did she change her clothes? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is like, okay, I get it. You know, yeah. I don't know what I believe and what I don't believe about that. Right. It, I it, do think that the police weren't looking at anybody else because they felt like it would really point it toward Diane. Well, yeah, it was pretty cut and dry. I mean, and her yeah. story was lame and yeah, yeah. all the, the physical evidence. Yeah. Yeah. This website also says that the Hughie family adopted the children and then refused to allow Diane's parents to see them. Mm -hmm. I read the letter their attorney wrote to Diane's father, and it seemed reasonable to me. They just want these scarred children to be able to move on with their lives. Of course, yeah. This website does, however, say that there was a man who confessed to his family and friends that he was the one who did the shooting that night. Did he have bushy hair? 
He does have bushy hair, and you can see a picture of him and her composite right. that she had made from the police that night. Right. Side by side, people, there are a lot of people who say, yeah, that's him. Huh. But this guy who confessed, his wife has come forward to say that, yeah, he was a very violent man. And the composite drawing of the bushy-haired man is is similar. Okay. But the website also says that Detective Dick Tracy and Detective Doug Welsh. I can't get over Dick Tracy. Dick Tracy (laughs) said that the records for this case had been destroyed, but they weren't. And when federal public defenders asked for the records, they discovered that when the sheriff's office said that they were following leads, about 30 to 35 of them, they actually weren't following any leads. Uh, They only worked to show that Diane was the killer. Right. Now, you can go and check it all out for yourself. I will, of course, have links in the show notes. But I think it's important to note that Diane was diagnosed with narcissistic, histrionic, and antisocial personality disorders. Well, there's a surprise. And she was labeled (laughs) by her doctors as a deviant sociopath. (laughs) Yeah. Now, while she's behind bars, she has never participated in any rehabilitation programs. She tells people that her surviving son is out of his wheelchair, that he's not paralyzed. What? He's not. She also plots how to get out of prison still. One of her plans is to commandeer a helicopter. (laughs) I know. Uh, It doesn't get any more bizarre. In 2008, before her first parole hearing, she had a psychological evaluation, and they were hoping she would have a little more introspection. But Diane, who still maintains her innocence, seems to have none. Before she was arrested for the murder of her daughter, she had an interview with a local news reporter where she says, quote, children are so easy to conceive and that being a mother is the most wonderful job, end quote. Wow. So here's what really gets it for me, because I looked through all of the stuff from the the dyingdowns.com where they just say over and over again that she has been wrongfully in prison all these years. I go back to the fact that she drove between six and 10 miles an hour that night on the road and she showed up and she had bandaged her own arm. So those two things for me, I'm just like, okay. So maybe some of this other stuff is true. Maybe they weren't looking at other leads. Maybe this, uh, you know, yeah. maybe there were things that they didn't go and check out. But it didn't. It doesn't change the other facts. It doesn't change the other facts that if this actually happened and another man shot these children, she was not in a hurry to get to the hospital right. in any way, shape or form. Sure. And for me, that's like, okay. That's that's all it that's all it took for me. Yep. If you're a mom and you feel like me, I mean, you can email me and tell me I'm wrong, I suppose. But that's just that was that was the nail in the coffin for me. That was sure. the one thing that really stood out because you can go through all of this stuff and read it and be like, OK, I see. I see they have a point there. They, they should have followed up on all these other leads because someone is innocent until proven guilty. Right. But she did go six miles an hour. Yeah. And there was more than one car that testified to that fact, there was more than one driver who testified to the fact in court that they were behind her for on that windy road and she wasn't going any faster. And than the that. fact that she's knocking futz. Yes, she <laughs> is. But that is the story of Diane Downs. That's all I have to say about that. Hey, Hitch to Homicide listeners. Have you read any good books lately or have you listened to any good books? All of the Sex and Lies series books, as well as the Jane Doe series, are available on Audible and iTunes. Hotter than hell in half of Alabama, the Sex and Lies series begins with Sex, Lies, and Sweet Tea. There are nine books to listen to in that series alone. Left as a newborn to die in a dumpster, she has no name. Tossed from foster home to foster home, she has no family. With no known past, she's deemed a perfect fit for a task force Washington denies exists. A selective assassin for the United States government, Jane Doe tracks down known terrorists on domestic soil. The Jane Doe books have been called a bit military, a bit assassin, and a bit genius. Start the new year by listening to a good book by me, Chris Calvert, on Audible or iTunes. Or if you'd like to read, go to chriscalvert.com and download some free books. And thanks for being a listener of Hitch to Homicide. Wow, Diane... She's uh, 
piece she's, of work. She's a piece of work. Mm-hmm. But you know what? I kept reminding me of every time uh, because her full name is Diane Downs. Right. So I always keep thinking of that thing you do, Diane, Diane Dane. Dane. <laughs> <laughs> you were so important to me. <laughs> Thanks for that, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, well, let's lighten it up and let's do a little Well, Bless Your Heart. Well, bless your heart. For this week's Bless Your Heart, I'm going to call this, instead of Escape from Alcatraz, it's Escape to the 7-Eleven. Okay. I love good 7-Eleven. Yeah. Love a good Icy. Yes. For most people, prison would be something you'd escape from and never look back if you ever found yourself in that predicament. But for these Texas prisoners, they just needed their creature comforts before coming right back. See, it's like what I'm saying. I love a good 7-Eleven. Okay. According to Dallas News, an inmate who was locked up in a federal facility in Beaumont snuck out only to get booze, tobacco, snacks, and food to bring back with him. Yeah. 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 They got (laughs) the snacks. Yeah. Well, you know, the food in prison is really bad. Yeah. Yeah. And it isn't just this one incident either. Inmates have apparently been using a back door to skip out (gasps) to land nearby, picking up contraband left behind for them and coming right back. Sheriff's Deputy Marcus. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) Sheriff's Deputy Marcus McLellan recently told the Beaumont Enterprise that inmates have been essentially making up their own in and out privileges at the facility (laughs) since day one. (laughs) (laughs) Sheriff's deputies in Jefferson County finally realized what was happening and laid in wait to watch it all go down. So it's not like a drug runner. It's a (laughs) 7-Eleven runner. It's a 7-Eleven runner. Okay. Okay. Around 5.45 p.m. This past Wednesday, a duffel bag was dropped off (gasps) (laughs) on the adjacent (laughs) property. And around 7.30 p.m., a 27-year-old Joshua Randall Hansen was observed leaving the prison to retrieve the bag. Okay, Josh. Josh is the runner. (laughs) On Hansen's way back into the facility after picking it up, he was arrested. No. Surprise, surprise. Once confiscated, the authorities said the duffel bag was full of whiskey, brandy, specifically, packages Uh of tobacco, snacks, fruits, and plenty of home-cooked food. Oh, yeah. who's home cooking at the (laughs) 7-Eleven? Maybe they were talking about those um, uh, corn dogs and stuff that are on the rollers or something. Hanson was already in the process of serving over, you know, a little over two years for conspiring to distribute designer drugs, but now will be likely to do additional time as he faces escape And marijuana possession charges. So there you go. So was there weed in the duffel bag too? It was all all food and snacks. Then how did he get the marijuana possession extra charge? I don't know. Maybe that was his initial charge. I have no idea. Maybe the home cooking was a good weed brownie. (laughs) I'm just going to put my own. I'm just making it up. That's what I do. I'm writing fiction for that story. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Necessity is the mother of invention, right? That's uh, absolutely true. (laughs) Well, if you know somebody whose heart who needs blessing or you have a bless your heart, you can send it to us. Go to hitchtohomicide.com. There's a little pull down menu. Mm -hmm. While you're there, you can also suggest case we're going to start doing a bunch of those this year absolutely that's my amazing husband out there in the studio and that's my beautiful bride in the booth join us next time on hitch to homicide bye y'all